Um, it's lovely being, thank you so much for that. It's lovely being back in York. I, I was here, I worked here from 1992 to 1997. Chris Kiriakou was on my interview panel and I reset up the PGC English course at the University of York and I became director of initial teacher training here. Before that, I was an English teacher, worked in London, North London in schools, comprehensive schools. And then from York, I went on to Edge Hill University and I was head of secondary education. And then I went on to Kingston University and I was head of the School of Education there. So there we were training undergraduate, postgraduate, MA, PhD students. And we set up a big um, foundation course in early years education, which we ran in conjunction with eight local FE colleges. So that was a foundation degree. And then in 2003, I read an advert in the paper uh, advertising for the post of General Secretary of the Association of Teachers and Lecturers. And uh, so I've been teaching for 12 years. I've been in teacher education for 12 years. And I thought, well, I could polish up my CV. I haven't got a chance. Give it a go. And bugger me if I didn't get it. So then I was in real trouble. <laughs> so that's what I've done for the last 10 years. I became General Secretary in 2003. And um, uh, now 2000, well, it'll be my 11th year soon. I know that when you look at me, you couldn't possibly believe that I got that much professional experience behind me. But I have. So, um, first of all, I'd like to praise the, uh, the wisdom of the Institute for Edu um, Effective Education for inviting me, because amongst trade unions, ATL is the leading advocate of research informed policy advice. And I am going to talk a bit about research informed and research based. So, you might want to, you might want to duck that, but I'm going to just take that on a bit. Um, we're not the, we're the third largest teachers union. We have um, um, 160,000 members working in schools, primary schools, secondary schools, FE college, and we've got a small number of members in universities, largely in education departments as well. But of the unions, we have the largest policy team. And that says something about the importance. We really do put our money where our mouth is. We have a, we have a policy team of over 20 staff working on a whole range of issues around curriculum, assessment, uh, paying conditions, pensions, uh, CPD, special educational needs, equalities, teacher professionalism. So we have a very big policy team. And my own experience as a teacher, as a teacher educator, as an academic, and now as a general secretary of a union in a highly political environment, my whole um, uh, rationale is to use evidence wherever I can to inform the arguments which are made to politicians, to the press, to civil servants, and to the membership, to teachers and lecturers as well. I think last year, we at ATL realised that an opportunity was developing for real progress, both on structures and relationships, to improve teacher connections to research. Now, we do have a Secretary of State, Michael Gove, who talks incessantly about his commitment to evidence and he has put his money where his mouth is. He's put £125 million to establish the Education Endowment Fund. Labour at that point, at that point Stephen Twigg was the Shadow Secretary of State for Education, so Labour was talking about an Office for Educational Improvement. And there was almost a real policy debate about research methodology, about randomised controlled trials, and the Institute for Effective Education itself was being instrumental in establishing the Education Media Centre. So ATL prides itself on being a nimble organisation and we decided the time was right to bring together a panel of researchers, politicians, policymakers and politicians to discuss the way forward. And some of you were there and we particularly welcomed Jonathan, i.e. Jonathan's enthusiastic contribution. Subsequently, ATL's paper, Using Evidence to Inform Education Policy and Practice, was published, and it's on our website. We've got an open website, so if you want our Using Evidence to Inform Education Policy and Practice, just go onto the website, go onto the policy section, click, and you'll find it there. I checked this morning, so you will find it. And uh, so I make no apology for basing my remarks today on that paper. I think there are four salient issues within that report which I want to highlight this afternoon. The first is on research methods, and there we argue that what works is an oversimplified concept on which to base research and policy. You can't just base it on what works, because it doesn't always work, and the what is important as well as the works. On policy, the second salient point, ATL argues consistently and with conviction that politicians should not intervene in matters of specific professional expertise 
such as pedagogy and the curriculum. We believe the policy turbulence caused by politicians diving in, saying hands off, hands off, and then diving in that you must teach history like this, you must teach reading like this, uh, you must teach literacy like this, is deeply damaging to an emerging sense of professionalism amongst teachers. On teachers and practitioners, we argue that measures are needed to stimulate demand from teachers for communication about research. There is not enough demand in the profession amongst enough teachers about research, and I'll talk about why I think that is. And our last point, the CASP point I want to emphasise in this talk today, is that both policymakers and practitioners could benefit from the establishment of a national education forum independent of government. There is a crying need for independence and properly based evidence uh, in our education system. And so those four principles underline what I have to say today. And I'd like to first of all remind you of a little history. The Hillage Report of 1998, commissioned by David Blunkett, who was then the Secretary of State for Education, it aimed to undertake an analysis of the direction, organisation, funding, quality and impact of educational research, particularly in the schools field. And then it aimed to produce recommendations for the development and pursuit of excellence in research relating to schools. And the report made a number of recommendations, including the establishment of a National Education Research Forum. And ever since then, government has professed an interest in linking both policymakers and educational practitioners to educational research. But as Estelle Morris said at the Coalition for Evidence-Based Education event here a couple of years ago, while the Labour government did, a, did commission evaluations of policies as implemented, it was not so good at weighing up research evidence to inform future policy. Now, the second argument I'm going to make is the mantra of what works dominates the political discourse. It dominates political discussion. If you talk to civil servants, if you talk to Michael Gove, if you talk to Tristan Hunt, if you talk to others, what the politicians want is a surefire, immediate correlation between what works and what teachers do. And they believe that if only they could get what works and teachers could know what works and then translate that into their practice in a simple, uncomplicated way, then we could raise standards of education materially. Uh, what works has been con used consistently across the political divide from, Labour to, from David Blunkett to Michael Gove. The, the, the language of what works is consistent. And now we have, we even have the what works network. Its lineage goes back to the post-war era of technocratic expert reviews. And the value of what works to the government is, of course, that on the whole, once you've appointed your expert, you can be pretty sure what the report is going to recommend. And when governments go for experts, for example, when Michael Gove commissioned last year Ben Goldacre to look at evidence-based research in education, he knew pretty well that Ben Goldacre was going to go for a what works methodology, more use of randomised controlled trials, etc., etc. So you appoint your expert and you get the answer you want. But a teaching practice which works, and we know this as teachers, for a particular group of pupils with a particular teacher in a particular setting, at a particular moment, may or may not be capable of replication. One research finding which has been picked up by politicians is the realisation that teaching and learning practice is by far the most important in-school factor for pupil attainment. There's a literature comprising classroom observation of various kinds, and the literature shows, and we know this as education practitioners, that classrooms are complex social settings. All the participants in the class bring to it a variety of values, a variety of understandings, a variety of knowledge, and attitudes to knowledge. Teaching in Tower Hamlet in London is not the same as teaching in Hessington in York. You may get the same, you may get very deprived pupils, you may get very affluent pupils in both settings, but the cultural context, the cultural awareness and the cultural knowledge they will bring to those different classrooms, the differences in uh, one a very mixed multi-ethnic setting, one much more monocultural setting, and, and a host of other differences will play out in what is deemed to be important and valuable and worth learning in both of those settings. And you cannot just simply replicate one with the other. 
The measured learning of the pupils in the class depends on all these variables. And practitioners in education, teachers and lecturers, are working with people in all their varieties. Like many other public servants, teachers are not doing things to people, or even for people, but with people. And policymakers and researchers who wish to engage and to develop practice must engage with this constraint on teachers. On the other hand, there is a shared body of knowledge within the profession about practice, which should be interrogated as to its real effectiveness. And of course, some teachers are more effective than other teachers. Some teachers are more effective than other teachers throughout their careers. Some teachers are more effective than other teachers at given moments. The problem for a what works approach is the danger of a complete oversimplification of the learning process. And ATO believes the term evidence-based may suggest, it could suggest, a single correct answer to a policy question which the government determines and then imposes externally. And we've had a lot of that. If you think back to the weaknesses in the literacy strategy and the numeracy strategy, that was a state-determined, state-imposed answer to a problem. And whilst it did lots of good things, it also created lots of problems which we're still living with today. ATL believes, however, the term evidence-informed <coughs> implies that the evidence does not self-evidently lead to a particular decision, that the decision by the state is a judgment, and as such, it must be open to question. And my next argument is that politicians ver are very defensive about questions from the profession, about what they are advocating. Now, education undoubtedly is one of the most value-laden areas of public policy. Not only politicians, but policymakers, practitioners, and indeed researchers bring values to their enterprise and balance them against practice. As a former Deputy Chief Social Researcher described it, influences on policy include experience, expertise, and judgment of officials and ministers, values and ideology, available resources, habits, tradition, lobbyists, pressure group, and the media, and all the pragmatics and the contingencies of everyday political life. And I can tell you, working close to governments, but I spent the day yesterday in the Department for Education in sanctuary buildings, you see at first hand all those pressures. And I would say that at the moment, I am dealing with the most highly ideological Secretary of State for Education and government and, and what they do is they believe, they believe that timed exams will raise education performance. They believe, completely contrary to the evidence, all the evidence, that performance-based pay will improve standards of teaching and learning and raise standards. They believe that a market-based system, competitive system where schools compete rather than work together with one another, uh, schools based as a market, that will raise standards against all evidence to the contrary. So at the moment, we're living through a time where ideology is by far the most important factor in driving forward what the politicians and therefore what the civil servants and therefore what the system has to respond to. Now, teachers, when faced with the evidence of rampant ideology, they often argue, and they do this to me, my members say, can't we take politician, politics out of education? And that would sound great, wouldn't it? but actually we can't. It's probably undesirable, and it's certainly not possible. And the reason why is because the state education system costs an awful lot of taxpayers' money. It should be subject to democratic control, and therefore the politicians have a role. Nevertheless, I absolutely believe that teachers are justified in feeling that current policies are derived from ideology rather than evidence. And I suggest that the quality of political debate at the moment is impoverished by hugely misleading use of bites of so-called evidence, which are both irrational um, and, um, and deeply damaging. I'll give one example. Uh, whenever you get, every three years, you get the OECD producing the international league tables, the PISA league tables, and you will hear, as you did the last, last year, that we are plummeting down the league tables. We are disastrous in maths. We are terrible at science. We're, 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 we're functionally illiterate uh, in literacy. Actually, the tables mean very little. Depending on which questions are used in the statistical mix, we could be 26 in liter literacy, we could be 22, we could be 19. 
Uh, science is even more variable. So, and the OECD, who produces the league tables, puts in small letters, these are statistically um, uh, um, not very sound, and what you should be doing is really looking at whether we're a top performer, a medium performer, or a low performer. Uh, but politicians seize upon apparent drops in standards of literacy, numeracy, and understanding of science to justify policies. That's what they see. Something must be done. And education is, is subject to something must be done more than anything else. Uh, even health, which is much more um, subject of political um, direction at the moment, nobody would say to a heart surgeon, well, something must be done. They'll say, they might say something must be done about low rates of operation success in that, in, in that hospital but they wouldn't then detail directly what must be done. But that's exactly what happens to education. And, um, but I, I'm going to argue that policies that the politicians put forward are very clearly neither determined nor influenced by an evidence base. Of course, education research is a branch of social science. And I think one step forward would be a more explicit recognition of the values underlying the research methods being used, such as where the research stands on the continuum between the focus on human agency and the focus on constraining structures, or the uses and weaknesses of both ethnography and statistical analysis. So, for example, one of the big questions which is increasingly being asked is about the data set derived from Ofsted inspection grades, whose impact both on individual schools and the system, and the teachers who work within it, is absolutely huge. Now, anyone using this database should be forced to face the fact, they should be absolutely forced to face the facts, that the Ofsted data consists of numbers which are derived from judgments, and those judgments are necessarily inconsistent, and the quality of those judgments is very doubtful. So when we talk about the Ofsted database and we derive judgments from that database, what should always be emphasised is the limits on its usefulness, the boundaries of what that data can tell us. But that very rarely happens. What happens is an Ofsted database is immediately translated into effective practice into what, into what works. And that impoverishes the whole idea that education is contested and contestable and there are different ways of achieving the same result. A more appropriate form of the plea to take politics out of education, I believe, is that politicians should not intervene in matters which are the specific expertise of teachers. Um, so, when it comes to professional practice in classrooms, we do need politicians to accept that teachers collectively know best. It is for researchers to identify what's best in various circumstances and to help teachers learn from one another. It's become commonplace for politicians to support freeing up teachers to teach by pointing out, politicians always do this, they say, well, no, no, um, no politician would tell uh, a surgeon how to operate, so we shouldn't tell teachers how to teach. And then the next breath, they tell teachers how to teach. Now, we can't expect politicians to be consistent and it's a pity that they don't understand and they don't digest the whole story about the factors behind variation in pupil achievement. A full analysis would suggest that the evidence is that politicians have very little intention of using evidence in the way that they claim. Because if they were really keen on doing that, they would be prepared for uncomfortable results. They would be prepared for results which challenge their ideology. Um, as we know, politicians' obsession with school structures runs quite counter to the evidence that, with the exception of selective systems, school structures make very little difference. Uh, we know, and politicians know, that around 85% of the variation in an individual pupil's achievement at school is due to factors external to the school, poverty being the most important factor in educational achievement. But that's very inconvenient for politicians who find it far easier to blame variation in pupil performance on the quality of the school rather than the much more, more difficult thing to tackle, which is poverty, endemic poverty, and its effect upon generations of children and young people. You know, is it, any, is it, is it by accident or design 
that you're much more likely to get an A grade in the southeast of London at A level than you are in the northeast. And is that related to the fact that in the southeast you're far more likely to get a job? You're far more likely to have parents who've been to university. You're far more likely to see that actually the result of studying is a better life than you are in areas of the country which are blighted by poverty and worklessness. And those issues, that context in which schools work, politicians don't want to engage with that because those issues are too difficult. And even when they're brought back to thinking about creating an environment for improving the average quality of teaching and learning, they soon drift off into byways and highways. So, for example, ACL is quite clear that one of the ways which you really raise practice in the profession, in the teaching profession, is by giving real attention to continuing professional development. Um, but politicians talk about continuing professional development, but don't then provide any structural resources or sufficient structural resources to do it. It's just too boring. It's just not sexy enough. Uh, neither too often does it appeal to the modern school leader, which increasingly resembles football management. You're as good as your last result, so it's much better when you take over a school to bring in your own team than to engage with the time-consuming progress of developing the team that you have. So now, having sort of slayed the politicians, I want to turn to how researchers and teachers can work together. It's clear to me that if you're a researcher, you want your work to be read, you want your work to be seen, you want your work to be understood by teachers. And you want to push your work out there. The problem is, there are not enough teachers who want to pull it, who want to see it, and who want to learn from it. And as researchers, or as teacher researchers, you want to make a difference, and you want to find an effective means to push your work towards your audiences, your, uh, however reluctant. But it's also necessary to find ways of getting over the barriers of reluctance from teachers. And what are the barriers, and what can be done about them? Well, I think the key barrier to teachers really wanting to be and able to be engaged in research, are uh, learning about research and learning about research findings, is workload. And I know last week the Teacher Workload Diary survey was published. Uh, we're now getting, on average, school leaders working 63 hours a week, primary teachers working over 60 hours a week, secondary teachers, on average, working over 55 hours a week. Now, that's the average, so there'll be many, many teachers working many more hours than that. And, and what causes this um, vicious regime of overwork, in ATL's opinion, is quite clear, and that's the inspection regime, it's Ofsted. So what teachers are doing nowadays, rather than too often engaging in deep thought about teaching and learning and relating their practice to uh, evidence, what they're doing is a panoply of bureaucracy, lesson plans, assessment pro formas, interrogation of data. It's as though nothing is done unless it's written down. You don't differentiate, you don't do assessment for learning, you don't plan for progression. Nothing is done unless it's written down. And that is involving teachers in just masses of paperwork. And it's not paperwork which leads to deep thought, because the more detailed the pro forma, the more you're splitting everything up. Actually, deep thought means that you actually um, you make connections. Nor is it differentiated. You know, Teachers who are just embarking on their career they need to do a different sort of preparation than teachers who've been in their career for 20 years, who don't need to write down everything because they might forget it. It's there on their fingertips. But there's a lack of differentiation in what's... Um, and, it, and the teacher workload survey shows that what's driving excessive workload is this pointless and petty bureaucracy where school leaders mm. demand it of teachers because they are afraid when the inspector calls, how can they make judgments? How can they evidence the quality of their judgments on teacher performance? It's big fleas have little fleas upon their backs to bite them, and it's really affecting schools and teachers. Despite these challenges, there are schools in various parts of the country which have managed to demonstrate significant levels of engagement with research, and it's worth considering both the lessons they've learned through this process and the practices they've adopted. There are examples of schools which have actively promoted and funded access to master's levels and doctoral study. And as one school leader pointed out, providing a bursary to support a teacher through an MED is cheaper than advertising in the TES. So some school leaders are recognising that absolute essential, um, if they're going to be effective, they've got to develop practice and practitioners in their own school. 
In other schools, there has been a sustained emphasis on developing professional understanding through action research or joint practice development. Um, and indeed, in one such school, South Hand High School for Boys, all these elements have been developed. There's access to an MED, PhD study to strengthen professional expertise. And there are small-scale local inquiry projects to increase professional understanding. There are summary extracts of published research used to enhance professional knowledge. And as the head teacher, Robin Bevan, explains, the issue is about the locus of and basis for decision-making in the classroom. It's not sufficient to justify our pedagogy or other practices on the basis of the latest inspection framework or an announcement from the government. An ever-increasingly capable, autonomous and professional workforce need the tools to make their own evidence-informed decision. I'll say that again because I think it's so good. An ever-increasingly capable, autonomous and professional workforce need the tools to make their own evidence-informed decisions. And what they don't need is what Policy Exchange, who are a right-wing think tank, they did a report on Ofsted, which got a lot of press two weeks ago, and they said school leaders and teachers need the scope to make the decisions which are right for their schools in their context. They do not need to be constrained by what they think the inspector will understand, which I think is probably the most damning um, thing I've heard on Ofsted for a long time. So what do we think, uh, what do we think is a way ahead? We believe, ATL believes, that teachers and school leaders should be given a contractual right to personalise CPD, and they should be given some control over the sorts of CPD that they get. It's ludicrous, we believe it's ludicrous, that teachers who are in the business of learning are not a learning profession, except in a minority of schools. Nearly 10 years ago, the, what was then the Teacher Development Agency produced a report describing deep-rooted problems in both the demand for and the supply of CPD. It's 10 years since that report was produced and little has been done to improve things. Teachers need the time to research what is known about practice in their area. Teachers need time to observe relevant colleagues and reflect together. And crucially, crucially, teachers must be given the professional respect and the authority to innovate and to experiment. Of course, within the accountability framework, but they must be given the opportunity to develop their professional practice. I know there's a lot of information, innovation going on in pockets, but the trick is, how do we spread it across the system? And, you know, that's exactly what happened in London Challenge. I think 10 years ago, London was absolutely vilified. Its comprehensive schools were vilified for being the lowest performing in the country. And there was London Challenge. Now, what did London Challenge do? Did it get a London strategy? Did it have challenge supervisors parachuting into schools saying that's the way to do it? Did it have Ofsted coming in and saying to the teachers, you're not doing it as a challenge supervisor? Says so. No, it didn't. What it did was very simple. It got schools working together. It got strong schools paired with schools which were struggling. It got teachers observing one another, peer observation. It got access to evidence-informed practice, schools working together, uh, Targeted help for schools. Why are your maths results so low? I can't get ahead of maths. OK, we'll help you do that. And as a result of that, what happens now? London schools are the highest performing schools in the country. And international researchers beat a path to the door of London schools to say, how did you make that transformational change? And the people involved in London Challenge said, what their answer? We started talking to one another. Of course... As schools become their own admissions authorities, as the local authorities uh, uh, diminish in scope and in function, uh, as schools compete over results, it becomes ever more difficult in that atomized system for schools to collaborate and cooperate. But if they don't, there's no system-way improvement of leading standards. I mean, we know, if you look at the TES website, over a million teachers um, put posting um, work on the website, sharing work. And it, we know if, if, you know if teachers are desperate for the next lesson plan, they, they want to share. But how much more would they want to share the reasoning behind effective practice? And we have to help them do, do something about that. And lastly, let's have a go at establishing something like the National Education Research Forum proposed by Hillage in 1998, charged with developing a strategy for educational research to shape its direction 
coordinate its conduct and support its application. Uh, Hillage said it's clear that to work, any such body should be independent of any one political party or stakeholder. Now, I think it would take government to establish this forum, the Department for Education, but government can't own it. It needs to be owned by all participants and not by a political party or by a sectional interest. It could borrow from models of independence, governance independence in other fields to ensure independence. In ATL's paper, we argue that the National Foundation for Educational Research could form the basis of this body, but the Institute for Effective Education could do so equally well, I'm sure. And we know that whoever um, founds it is going to be controversial and cause difficulties. But we do need an independent body beyond the Education Endowment Foundation. We do need an independent body with independent governance and with governance which, is about, which has teachers and lecturers on it as well, to really enable the profession to look at the foundations, what should be the building blocks of their practice, and enable teachers to get much better access to evidence-informed practice, which will improve their teaching, written and communicated in a language that they can understand, at a length they can use, and where they can see relevant links to their practice. We need to make evidence available to teachers in ways they can really use it to become better professionals. And we're not there yet. Thank you. Wow, Mary. That's got lot, I'm sure that this has instigated uh, lots of questions. So we have a few, more, a few minutes to, to do so, so I will... Uh, God, it's awful, I'll, isn't it, the questions? Uh, I'll, <laughs> I think that's the best part. <laughs> yes. Um, hello. Um, oh, sorry. Can you say uh, who you are and where you're from <clears throat> before you say you're... Uh, you're I'm right. a teacher from a homeless charity. Um, I was wondering about the um, charter schools in America. Yeah. They're 10, 15 years in. Are they equivalent to our uh, free schools over here? Yeah. I was wondering what the evidence is from their 15 years of experience. As we're starting out there 15 yeah. years in, is there any evidence coming from there? Well, it's really mixed. The evidence about charter schools is really mixed in America, and it depends on how they're... Because they're introduced... In America, the different states have huge control over their education systems in the state, mm -hmm. uh, how teachers are hired and fired and curricula. And those states, like Massachusetts, which uh, introduced charters in a very controlled way, with very high quality standards and very uh, and really regulated them, then there's been successful practice. But other states uh, like Tennessee and Maryland, I mean, there's you know there's just appalling practice. And um, um, what happens routinely is um, estate agents buy up land, they build a school, the school gets public funding. They then charge up to 30% of their regular annual funding to the school for rent. They impose their own board. What the board do, who are directors of the company, is that they provide services to the charter school, which can be up to another 30% of the revenue. So, you know, you've got examples in the worst performing states of kids being charged for extra English and maths lessons, kids being charged to graduate, kids being charged to... Um, you know, that you've got example of really rotten practice. And then, of course, uh, you look at what's happening here mm -hmm. and you look at uh, the King Science Academy of Bradford and mm -hmm. the financial issues there. You look at Margaret Hodge questioning Chris Wormold from the Department of Education at the um, Public Accounts Committee two weeks ago, where she said, you know that Academy chief executives are lining their pockets to the tune of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money because what they do is the Academy chain appoints a board of directors, their directors provide services to the chain, like curriculum services, HR services, IT services, and there's no conflict of interest. You know, I'm a director, I'm providing these services to the school, and Chris Wilmore said, well, as long as there's no profit being made, well, why would you do it if there wasn't profit being made? So, you know, um, it just depends. And what we're finding, uh, at maybe you saw yesterday in the Telegraph today, that 14 academy chains have been told they can't expand any further because there are massive issues around financial irregularities and around the quality. Um, what they're finding, what the government is finding, and I told Michael Gove this would happen and he didn't listen, so there you go. Um, well, you know, if you don't have any local accountability and you don't have strong 
controls around how money is spent, then what will happen is um, um, private companies will cream it off. Similarly in Sweden, look at, you know, Sweden was uh, led on free schools. About 40% of children in Sweden now go to free schools run by private companies. There's been a major inquiry by the Swedish government two years ago finding that too many free schools don't have libraries, don't have dining halls, they don't have PHSE, they don't have careers education, they have a very narrow curriculum, they're employed vast numbers of unqualified teachers, and in fact, Sweden really is plummeting down the P's and E tables. And Michael Gove is very interesting, and don't let me get, don't get me onto him, but he's very interesting, <laughs> because when he came in, he started talking about Sweden. We've all got to be like Sweden, Sweden. And as soon as Sweden starts getting a bit, then he stops talking about Sweden, and then he goes on to, we've got to go to America, and then you get the evidence of massive financial irregularities well, in America. Yeah, well, well, Finland doesn't support his thesis. Finland is a wholly comprehensive system. Children go to their local comprehensive school. There's a broad and balanced curriculum. There's a high degree of teacher qualification. It takes five years to become a teacher in Finland. Then there's a requirement and an entitlement to CPD. It's completely different. Mm. Thank you. Okay, uh, Carol. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I'm Chief Executive of the National Foundation for Educational Research uh, and al also formally the... Yeah, we want you to take over this yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Would you well, like to? I'd love to. I'd yeah. love to. But I'm also formally the Director of Research at the Department for Education. Uh, so I've seen things from both sides of the table. Mary, I found your uh, remarks rather depressing. Um, and I, particularly having worked on this at... Um, the department and now at NFER, the whole evidence-based or evidence-informed teaching agenda, which I really care passionately about. And I wondered if there were any other points you might want to make about how we can move forward uh, in a positive way. And one of the things that I've been reflecting on uh, is, the, is how do we grow that demand and whether there's a role for teachers to drive the research agenda more effectively so they feel they have greater ownership of the research questions and then we have a ready audience when we as researchers have produced that output and how we could facilitate that and help make that happen and develop a database of research questions which is driven by the profession in the same way that something similar exists in, in medicine. And I did work with Ben Goldacre and commission that review. It was an interesting experience. Um, yeah, I heard there's a fascinating review, fascinating for what you didn't know, which came out quite clearly yeah. And he came from a medical background, yes, and he, he so he had those particular um, perspectives. And he's um, young man who didn't the <laughs> my other question uh, was, uh, there was an attempt before my time, so I don't know exactly why it failed, but there was an attempt after Hillage to set up uh, a national education research forum, yeah. and it failed. And then there was something else after that called the acronym was SURF. I can't remember what the letters stand for, um, and they were attempts to bring together academics, policy makers, and I think in some cases practitioners. And I don't know why they failed and what we need to do differently in future to try and make that work. And it may be that there weren't enough practitioners involved that then potentially brings us right back round to the College of Teaching. Yeah. So I wonder if you've got thoughts on those two issues. Well, you want to start the College of Teaching and then move around to... I mean, I'm sorry you found it depressing, but I'm not in a... I'm not in a I didn't mean to be depressing. I do think the pockets are good practice, but I think there are real issues. I think teacher workload is a massive issue. You can't get round it, you can't get underneath it, you can't get over it. And if teachers are spending and teachers are reporting that um, the pressures of the accountability regime means that nothing is done unless it's written down, uh, and they're spending hours and hours and hours and hours recording practice, recording progress, filling in data sets, filling in lesson plans. I've seen recently quite a number of five-page lesson plans for each lesson. Um, you know, I, we had, a re, we had a, um, uh, an inquiry from a, a teacher, a good teacher, teacher for five years, saying that uh, her school management was requiring her to upload lesson plans from three months ago to go onto the, onto the school's website, so in case of spectacles. And I, I just think that this practice is, is, is far too prevalent, it's not endemic. And I think the thing that Brian Lightman, the General Secretary of ASCOL, talks about, he talks about confident schools and underconfident schools. And if you're in a confident school, you probably get a school head teacher who is able to resist the worst of that minus bureaucracy and able to say no, and able to say when the inspector calls, no, I know about how the effectiveness of this teaching through these things, and is able to stand up. 
But if the more the school is approaching the floor targets, uh, the, and those are normally schools in inner city areas where it's a very great challenge, then um, the more that teachers are spending far too much time recording rather than thinking about practice. And we know this is happening. We know the department is desperately worried about teacher workload. I had a meeting about it all day yesterday. We gave evidence to the school teacher review body two weeks ago, and they, we couldn't get them away from teacher recruitment and retention. And, and they're desperately worried about teacher workload, and we're quite clear that it is far too high and it's driven by that. Now, as long as you've got teachers spending the vast amount of their time in a highly stressed state, writing plans for somebody else rather than thinking, they simply don't have time to ask those broader questions. But something else happens as well, which is a sense of entitlement to ask those questions, a sense that they have professional expertise, a sense that they can say no, a sense that they can argue or, or in different ways, that is lost as well. Now, I'm not saying that's for all the profession, but I'm saying that's the lived and worked experience of too many of the profession. And unless we look at that and acknowledge it and see how to deal with it, then we're going to not get where we want. And very interestingly, yesterday, I think we're in a very interesting place with Ofsted at the moment. We had Tristan Hunt writing in The Guardian last week saying, in effect, you know, we need an inspection regime, but the quality of what we're getting is too variable and it costs too much. We've got the right of the Tory party saying that Ofsted is part of the education blog and is promoting an educational orthodoxy. I thought about laughing, but there you go. Um, you've got Ofsted itself now saying, Michael Bullshaw saying, no, 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 we don't want to comment on teaching styles, and no, 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 we can't make judgments off teachers in 20 minutes, and um, no, 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 we, we, you know, we, we shouldn't be using data for these purposes, as though it was like 1984, Eurasia was never at war with those stages, although you never said those things beforehand. No, we remember. So whilst they're in a very, very dangerous position, you've got policy exchange and Civitas saying the inspections are too variable, Ofsted don't know how to use data, um, the, the effect on workload, and yesterday, for the first time, after a day's negotiation, we were actually going to get, and I can't say that because it's private, so you can't understand, but I'll, I'll be, I'll be super be, super be it's confidential. <laughs> <laughs> we're actually, I think, going to get a serious study in the effect of Ofsted on practice, and the effect of Ofsted on workload, because ministers are so worried about it. Now, that may all be very depressing, but I would come back to you and say, we can't live in la-la land, we can't be Pollyannas. If that's the experience of teachers and their lead, 40% of young teachers leave within five years, if you're going to be a researcher and you want an appetite for the profession, you have to be engaged in the political issues. You can't ignore them, you can't align them, you have to be engaged with us in those issues. And what we're arguing for in ATL is a sense of professionalism and an entitlement to professional culture and professional work and professional respect. Of course, within a proper accountability structure, but Ofsted is not a proper accountability structure. It is, Chris Woodhead said it, and it remains an instrument of fear and terror for teachers, and it has never changed from being that. And I think it's quite <laughs> 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 Yes. Paul Kipp from the University of East London. Um, I think um, if we're going to talk about using research, what is essentially the quality of research also has to be very high. I'm actually extremely surprised that you're kind of undermining Ben Goldacre on this because the one thing he has campaigned for and revealed is incredible variability of quality of the people that actually control the research agenda, who control the methodology, and who have deceived widespread numbers of doctors on what is the most effective response to medical situations. And one thing I really advise strongly against there should be no monopoly on who uh, runs any kind of education or research forum. Because believe you me, there are issues of quality in every aspect of educational research. Thanks. Uh, Paul Crisp, Managing Director of the Centre for the Use of Research and Evidence in Education, QA, and I'm also Chairman of Governors of the Secondary School. Um, several points, if I can. This isn't a question or even particularly coherent. Um, the 
one of the things we know from the work that we've been doing is that close case analysis is an extremely effective tool in the hands of teachers. And it can look, if you're not particularly sympathetic to it, like a lot of bureaucracy. The school that I'm uh, uh, chairman of uses very close monitoring of pupil progress, and if you're not sympathetic to it, it can look like a lot of bureaucracy. So I think we have to be careful about um, uh, distinguishing between those processes that are genuine in support of the education outcome and those things which are done purely in order to jump through somebody else's hoops. Uh, but sometimes the same process can do both of those things for you. Uh, secondly, I don't think NERF did fail, it just ran out of money uh, and, the f and the funding was withdrawn, but it did suffer a bit, I think, for, from under-representation of the, the practitioner interest and was a bit provider-driven. And one of the problems I think we have whenever we're having the debate about um, how do we join research up with practice is that it's too driven by those who provide the research and not enough uh, engaged with those who, who want to draw it down. Robin Bevan is an interesting example of one of those people who's on the, on the consumer end of that and he chairs the National Teacher Research Panel which was a body established years and years ago mostly funded by TDA um, which um, was specifically set up to try and create a community of, of users of research who also turned into a community of producers of research and it's a bit unfortunate that we can't find ways of, uh, of, of, of giving that a bit more life and Curate have been involved in that for a long time so I should declare an interest. Um, the last point I want to make and this may be a question uh, is that um, uh, I think we've seen some experience in the last few years of a sh in my view shocking reluctance on the part of the teachers to um, pay for uh, a professional organisation uh, and their, the response to uh, the GTC and the funding thereof I thought was an astonishing overreaction in comparison to what almost every other professional body does. Um, do we think that there is a possibility that a genuinely independent research operation, perhaps linked to uh, the College of Teachers, could actually come into being and would teachers pay for it? I'll go to the question. I, I was on the um, the, uh, the book panel looking at the, the, the scope of the work around the College of Teaching. And um, I, I think that it's a very interesting idea whose time may have come. Uh, we were always very supportive of the GTC. It was another teachers' union which wasn't. Uh, and they shouted very loudly about it. And they're very unhappy about, the GTC, uh, about College of Teaching. But I think and it's probably an idea whose time has come, because I think now there is an understanding that uh, Sam Friedman, who was Michael Goh's policy staff, uh, said to me recently, when we're having a, a, a discussion, a heated discussion in the pub over the uh, Michael Goh's legacy, he said, well, you know, Mary, the one thing we didn't do is CPD. We neglected CPD, and if you have a college of teaching, which would make it as a requirement to be in the college, and the different levels, you know, fellow, associate, associate fellow, and so uh, requires engagement in research. That might be a vehicle for stimulating demand for effective, informed evidence, which can inform teachers' practice. I think teachers want to teach better. I think they're hungry. Uh, you know, you look at what you do. I think the TES Connect website is a real example of how teachers want to develop practice. And but I think. They want to do that more than sharing lesson plans and schemes of work. They want to know how to do better. But I'll just finish with one thing. I was a teacher trainer for all those years, and now we've got School Direct, which is effectively teaching in school. And I think there's one big issue which the profession really does need to develop, and that is this. You can be a very, I was a very effective teacher, I will say myself, really from my second year of teaching. I could teach very effectively. It wasn't until I'd done my MA at the Institute of Education that I had a language to describe practice. And mm -hmm. teachers too often know why they're doing something in that class and with those children. But to get a meta language to describe practice and engage with what works and evidence and information, that requires something else. That requires to be at a high level. And we need to support teachers in doing that. And unless we do do that, the move to the just a whole scale move to school based training is another big issue around how we get an evidence informed profession. I haven't talked about that today, but I think it's a massive issue.
We'll take up one question down here. Let's let Lady go now first, and then uh, and then Jonathan, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. Um, I'm Katie Bloom. I'm from the National Science Learning Centre, just up there where I, I work in professional development. Um, it's not so much questions, it's just some general observations. I'll be very quick. Um, we have thousands of teachers coming in there, uh, well, thousands of teacher days. Um, and uh, through the years, I've seen them become more and more demoralised about the profession that they loved. Um, and many of them are, are looking to walk away from it. And we hear horror stories um, about the, the whole Ofsted regime, uh, head teachers that will stop um, students in the, in the corridor to say, what's your target grade? Um, <laughs> and I tell them that every year I do a search on Ofsted in, in, the, in the evidence base to, to, to see whether there is indeed evidence that Ofsted raises attainment. And every year I, I come back with absolutely nothing on that at all. Um, well, in the courses that, that we do, which have high elements of action research in them. So they come on residential courses, we get them to go away and do something from the course on their practice as an action research project and come back on a second residential period and share that. Um, and they find that transformative. They, and and it, that those sorts of things can be um, an episode which keeps them in education because it reconnects them with what they went into education for. Um, I don't know if anyone was at the um, Research Ed conference last October in Dulwich. There were 500 teachers that came from all over on a Saturday, spending their money to attend that. There were 500 on the waiting list, and then you know people just started giving up. So there's not a lack. There's not there's not a lack of appetite within the teaching profession for research. Um, there is a lack of time, and there is a lack of access. Um, and I think that's a really big stumbling block for, for many. Thanks a lot. And what, what yeah, I guess, um, so I'm Jonathan Sharples. I'm based here at the Institute for Effective Education, but I'm on secondment at the Education Endowment Foundation. And I guess, following on from your point about accessibility and time, one of the things the EF produces is the Teaching and Learning Toolkit. Um, and I mean, for those who don't know, the, the toolkit is a synthesis of thousands, of tens of thousands of studies done in hundreds of thousands of schools in many, many different contexts. And what, what the findings of, of all these synthesis, they all point in the same direction, it's the same reviews that we do, all the, all the things around the toolkit, that it's high quality teaching methods that make the big, biggest difference. Feedback, developing thinking skills, cooperative learning, um, etc. So the you, 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 the point about what works, I, I, it doesn't seem to fit with, when, when we do these studies and we look at thousands of studies in lots of different contexts, the same themes emerge and emerge. Now that's always what's worked in the past. You know, that it can only tell you what has worked and obviously that needs to be translated and taken forward in your particular context. But, but the idea that, that you, you can find what's worked, it's not the only piece of information you need to know how it works, why it worked, for whom it's worked, what they thought of it while they were doing it. But you need that rich picture as well. But, so it's interesting, what do you think of the toolkit as a synthesis of what's worked? I, I think the toolkit is very powerful. It's very powerful. And I use it a lot, actually. And, and the other thing I think about the toolkit is that um, the EEF is not afraid to say what doesn't work. Yeah. So, you, so you, you clearly say selection depresses achievement. Setting depresses achievement for working class kids. <laughs> um, you say, performance related say, there's no evidence that it raises standards. So I, you know, the EF has um, established its independence. The the, the 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 context in which I was talking about what works is the context of not the EF and not um, uh, effective synthesis of multiple research studies and what lessons we draw from them. The context I'm talking about what works is the context of where many of my members work, which is in highly repressive um, work organisations with highly rigid um, um, weight and um, bureaucracy around your practice and a constant fear of what happens when the inspector calls. And that fear highlighted by Ofsted's inability to control the quality of this inspection team. Um, and, um, and I, so, so then what works becomes not something which teachers can engage with and do with, but it's done to. 
it's imposed on them. And that's the thing that, and, and you know, if you look at the first iteration of the literacy strategy, which I, I was at Keatsden, uh, head of education when we did that, so that was one of my areas of research. I don't do research anymore, but you know, you look at how that was uh, first implemented, and uh, you get you get an Ofsted report which says standards of te the first evaluation of the, uh, the national literacy strategy said in the Ofsted thematic survey standards of teaching have improved, but there's been no evidence of improvement in standards of learning. <laughs> Actually, I kept that before. You can keep it. Isn't it? So, so, so it, 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 it's how you use what works, yeah. and the professional experience, the opportunities of what works is that's the way to do it, and that's what we need to move away from. And we need to understand that all those research studies give us very valuable information about practices, understandings, approaches, evidence, but all those have to be contextualised within your practice. Yeah. Yeah. The, the issue I would say, though, is that if, if, if that message can be taken as, well, therefore, it's impossible to capture what's working. No. And, and, and I know you don't mean that, yeah, but, no, the, but that's, that's what people can say. So it is, it, my, yeah. my context is absolutely unique, and it's impossible no. to find out by looking across studies about what things seem to be emerging. Because yeah. so the things that seem to be emerging, I think, are the very things that can empower that professionalism. Yeah. And, 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 and indeed, if you look, I, I tweet quite a lot. If you want to get on Twitter, it's Mary Barrister at ATL. I'm trying to get 2,000 followers. <laughs> and uh, my, I do a re and I get I get very irritated by offset. I'm I'm very angry at offset actually. It's, it's very angry. Who is and, it? Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, when Michael Wilshaw wrote, you see, he writes a letter to all these departmental teams and say, don't talk about teaching styles. And my tweet was, well then, what's offset going to be observing lessons for? Is there no such thing as evidence informed practice? Should teachers not have access to ways of teaching? Does Ofsted not have a view about what approaches are more effective or not? Now you're saying not, which of course then raises the big question why they're going to talk to the So I, am, I agree with you. All I'm talking about is what works too often in the particular political discourse mm -hmm. we're in and when the state of oppression becomes that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and, and we have this policy turbulence, policy tourism mm -hmm. and government Interfering in a ludicrous way where it should back off. I mean, we will say it's a toolkit, okay, so not a recipe book. That, yeah. okay. Backing <laughs> off is the. <laughs> we can continue these conversations out while we have tea. We'll only have now about. A, well, maybe we can stretch it to 12 minutes or something like that. And then, um, and then there's a session in here with Peter Rudd here um, about uh, raising.